Hello and welcome back to this Learning Mari for Beginners series. Today we're going through part four, painting and projections, two of the most important tools in Mari. We're going to go through case studies, everything you need to know. So yeah, let's get started. So you'll notice here I've got a camera from some previous videos just to change of scenery because I'm getting a bit bored of staring that head and I'm just going to talk about the paintbrush tool first of all and then the paint through or the projection tool and go through some of its settings that I use on a daily basis when I'm painting and what a beginner should know in terms of painting inside of Mari. So if I stroke onto the mesh, then you'll see that that's that. It's on my paint buffer, it's not yet baked. So I can press B to bake that. Again, if you don't know about the paint buffer, do go back and watch that video. Um, and we have that paint data in this node that I have selected or in the layer that you're painting with. Again, we're gonna to touch on nodes in a lot more detail in the next video. So don't worry too much if that's going over your head. We're just gonna talk about painting today. So let's talk about some of the settings when it comes to painting. As you remember in the paint buffer episode, I mentioned that once you've got paint baked down, it can be quite difficult to get rid of it because you can't just use the paint buffer eraser because it's no longer in your paint buffer. So let's paint this down and see how we can get rid of it. That's probably one of the most important things when it comes to painting. So I've got this on my mesh and if I were to go to the paint buffer eraser, it's not gonna work. So how do we remove paint data? Well, quite simply, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go up to this toolbar in the top of Mari and you'll see we've got this mode. So this is similar to blending modes or it is blending modes. If I open it up, you can see we've got loads nested inside of each other. So if you're familiar with blending modes from Photoshop, then we've got darken, we've got lighten, we've got add here, we've got overlay somewhere. Your standard blend modes, but there's one that you may not have seen before in other texturing or graphic design packages, we've got this clear option. So if I now go to clear, it's gonna think about it for a second. Eventually. So now that it's finished changing to this new mode, when I stroke onto my paint buffer, it's still putting stuff onto my paint buffer, but the way that that stroke data is being interpreted, instead of applying the color that I've got set in my color selector, it's actually clearing whatever is on the mesh. So if I were to bake, you will notice that it's gone. So changing to the clear mode is how you get rid of paint data that you don't want anymore on your mesh. As soon as you get into that mentality, then it makes sense, but it's a little frustrating. And as you just saw, it takes a while to change. But so I'm gonna switch back to normal. This is one thing, if you're ever trying to paint on your mesh and you don't quite understand why it's not painting, then this can often be why, because you've left it in clear mode. I do that all the time. And then I'm like, why isn't it working? And it's actually because I've been stupid and not changed it back. So that's how you erase paint data. So I'm just gonna quickly get rid of all of this. I'm going to hold R on my keyboard and that changes the radius of my brush and I can go up here to radius and also do it there and then I can move it back down. Also worth mentioning is that while you can apply blend modes to the other strokes that you do, the only ones I really use are normal and clear because any other blending that I want to do, I can do inside of my merge nodes in the node graph. Again, node graphs we covered properly in the next video, but it's just worth mentioning that I don't like to confuse myself by using any other mode other than normal and clear because all the other operations that you might wanna do usually can be done in your layers of your node graph. So next to that, we have some tick boxes and all that these control is basically if you're using Wacom or any sort of tablet, then if you have these ticked on, basically it means that pen pressure will control these values. So at the moment, my alpha and my radius are controlled by pen pressure. So let me just demonstrate that. So if I just, I'm gonna put a slight dot here. And that's me pressing down lightly onto my object with my Wacom. Then if I turn them both off and I'm gonna press down lightly as well, and you'll see that the effect is no longer using pen pressure. So it's just doing it 100%. So when you're painting, this can be really useful. Pen pressure is super useful when it comes to this sort of stuff. So I will sometimes change these on and off, but again, it's each their own. So we've got radius here, which we've talked about. You can use the R button. We've got opacity here. You can change that with the O button on your keyboard and then push the mouse up and down and that will change that. It's not a shortcut I use all the time. Often I'll just come up here to change it, but obviously 100% opacity versus 10% opacity, which is 0.1, will give you very different results. And if we view that not with our shader, if we just view the base color, then you'll see how that affects that. So this green color here on the left is only coming through 10% as much as the 100% opacity on the right. So if I undo those, I'm just gonna clear my paint buffer. If we take a look at flow next, so flow basically means how quickly the ink or the paint in your brush comes out. So if I have flow really low, if I go back and forward over the same spot, unlike opacity, it will eventually get to 100% because if I were to have a really low opacity, it just cuts off at whatever the highest value I put in that slider is, but flow will eventually get to 100% if I stood there for long enough. If I turn my flow up to one, now it will just go down a lot quicker. So this is really good if you wanna kind of get more airbrush looks or you wanna get something a bit more organic because you can slowly build up color or masks and stuff like that. So I'll often play with the flow or I'll set it a little bit lower and set it to my pen pressure so that I can use pressure to build that up the way that I want it. 
So that's really all the options in our top tab. But as you remember from the previous video, we've also got this tool properties palette here, which has a lot more options. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open that and we'll just take a look at some other interesting ones inside of here. So if you've ever used Photoshop, you will probably be familiar with the brushes inside of Photoshop and how you can customize them. So if you wanna do that inside of Mari, then this tools property, when you've got the paintbrush open is exactly that. So we can change things like our opacity and flow that we saw there, but you can also add jitter, which basically adds a bit of randomness to the opacity. We've got jitter on the position. So one good thing about it is at the bottom here, you can see a representation of it. So I'm just gonna lower the radius a bit so we can see that. And then let's up the jitter and you'll see if I turn jitter position on, now what it does is it kind of moves the position of every single stroke around. So now it's looking a bit more like a spray can. So jitter kind of just adds some randomness. You'll see we've got the pressure options here that are in the top. We've got a radius and we can add jitter to the radius. So sometimes it will be bigger, sometimes it'll be smaller. We've got the rotations at the moment because I'm just using a round stroke, then it doesn't matter the rotation of it. If I change that, it's not gonna change anything. But if you're using a stroke that isn't symmetrical, then that will obviously change things. And again, you can add just to that. So steady stroke is a really useful one. And it's one that I will often use if I'm trying to get more precise details. For example, I've been doing some freelance work on some shoes recently and steady stroke was really good for getting stitching because it just meant that I could follow the curve of the shoe to make sure that the stitching was always equal distance from the edge of the sole. Uh, so we've got two kind of steady stroke modes. I usually just use smoothing and what you can do is you can choose this delay and this will basically draw a line behind your cursor and it will start smoothing stuff out. So if I do that versus no steady stroke, you will see that my line is a lot smoother on this one. And obviously the more you up the delay, the smoother it's gonna get. So that's really, really handy for doing some details if you want them to look a lot more precise. And then we've got distance, which is just a basically a different way of working it out. You can see it takes a little bit longer till it kicks in. So that's why I like smoothing. So smoothing, however, starts immediately and it just seems to average the movements of your mouse, which I find just personally a little bit better. And then we've got this tail meet option, which basically if I have no tail, it just stops when I let go. If I have tail on to meet, then what it will do is when I let go, it jumps to where the cursor was and you'll just get a little bit more. So I don't usually have that on, but it's there. So at the bottom, we've got this brush tip option. If you've ever made a custom brush inside of Photoshop where you've brought in an image to use as the brush tip, then that's exactly what this is doing. So you can find your path and bring it in. Again, it's not an option that I use. In general, what I will do is I will either use the ones of the shelf. We've got loads of uh, great examples here. So this one's really cool. Um, I use this one actually a lot just for breakup for metals. And you can see that that's got a bitmap here to use for the brush tip. And it, what I often do is I'll just take one from the shelf and then I'll customize that rather than making my own one from scratch because it's just a really good starting place. Like for example, if I want to make stitching, then what I can do is I can just start editing just a basic brush and got like that. And then what I need to do is I just need to add a little bit of spacing between each stroke like that and then I just need to change the rotation so where's that the rotation for here and then obviously I wanted to align it to a stroke so let's make sure that it's done that and then let's just set the scale a little bit more I set the radius down then it needs a bit more spacing and finally just the flow and the opacity just go back up and then with the steady stroke I've got very quickly just a really basic stitching and obviously when that's really tiny on the mesh doesn't matter that even though a big bit bigger up, it doesn't really look like a stitch when it's smaller, it doesn't really matter. So I often just play with these settings to make my own brushes. One tip as well, like if I draw, obviously I get lines, but what I can do if I want a straight line, like again, like a lot of other graphic design programs, if I just press shift, I can start doing perfectly straight lines. So that's also another really handy tip. Yeah, so that about sums up the tool settings of the normal paintbrush. Uh, next up, we're gonna look at the projection brush and see what that does for us. Cool, so we're back in this other project now and I'm gonna use this mesh to demonstrate using the projection tool and you're gonna see why in a second. So all I've got here is I've just got some basic nodes, again, covered in the next video, so don't worry too much about that. And what I've done here is I've dragged and dropped some images into my image manager that I'm gonna to use to demonstrate how the projection tool works. So what is the projection tool? Well, it's basically the way of using an image to put paint onto your paint buffer and then onto your mesh. So I've got three images here. I've got a texturing XYZ skin map. 
I've got this marble texture and I've got a substance procedural that I've baked out of substance um, and I like to use for texturing because they're really, really cool. And we're gonna use these three things in different ways to show you how this projection tool can be used. So to get painting with the projection tool, all you need to do is just drag and drop this onto your canvas and then that's gonna set it up and it's gonna switch you to the paint through tool. I'm gonna call it the projection tool, but paint through projection basically means the same thing in my head, but they call it the paint through tool. When you've got that, you'll see that where you're viewing now has this image kind of layered on top. And so let's go through some shortcuts that are really useful first and foremost. So it's obviously way too big at the moment. This is because I'm using like an 8K image and you can press control and shift and that will scale it down. You can now see that slightly smaller in your viewport. You can also press shift to move it around and you can press control and you can press control to just rotate that image as well. With scaling, if you press control and shift like we're using earlier and you press at the edge rather than elsewhere, then it will do it in just one axis. So I can do it in just the X or the Y. Obviously that will distort it. But if you want it back to the default, scale, then you can head over to your tool properties and you can either type in here, so I can press one and one to set that back, or I can reset it as well. And that will do the rotation as well. You can change all this here. So I'm gonna scale this down and we will just test painting through this first of all. So I've got a paint node here that I'm looking at and I'm just gonna throw some color down and you'll see it's now putting this image onto my mesh. So I'm gonna let that bake and then I can move around and obviously it's stretched because of the way I was painting it. So now I can cover this bit up. And this is often how digi doubles will be done in the visual effects industry. I, I've done this way too many times. So this nose, for example, just set that up a bit nicer, but that's one use of the projection tool being really, really handy. So one thing I forgot to mention whilst I was painting this haunting thumbnail for the video is that when you're using the projection tool, if you're trying to view through to your mesh and this image is getting in your way, if you press shift and minus, then that will change the opacity of it down and shift and plus will change it up. So that can be really useful because if it's too high, then you can't really see where you're painting. Um, so yeah, I just use that quite often just to change it up and down. Yeah, cool. But you're not always going to be doing digi doubles or doing faces. So that's quite a niche case. And obviously I'm using a texturing XYZ image here, but what if I wanted to do a bit of projecting through grunge or other things? Well, let's look at some other use examples that the projection tool is super, super handy for. So this head was originally supposed to be like a marble head. And so what I've done is I've applied one of my images, this marble texture that I've got, and I've placed that down on my mesh and using a tiled texture, that's obviously put it everywhere. But you can see, because this isn't a tiled image that I'm using, it's just one that I found from textures.com. You can see that we've got some seams. So another use of the projection tool is that you can use it to clean up seams. So I'm gonna drag and drop this texture that I'm using for the tiled node, and I'm gonna just scale this up. And if I go to my paint node here that I'm merging on top, again, more on that in the next video about nodes, um, then what I can do is I can just line this up and then you can see I can start painting out this seam. I let that bake and then I can kind of move around and start playing with other bits that need the seam painted out. on this nose, for example. So we had some other shortcuts that I didn't talk about in the last video. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually just gonna delete this tiled node so you can just see what we've been painting. And you'll see now we've got this transparency underneath. Um, so let's look at some of these other shortcuts. So you can see if I paint through this image, it's only going to the edge of where this image is set up. So if I move it around, I can now paint up there. But what if I wanted to kind of repeat through, if you are painting with a tiled texture, then maybe you wanted to paint it outside of that. So if I press the semicolon key, then that will let me start repeating. So I can now paint everywhere. So I'm gonna undo that and I'm gonna turn it back off so it stops repeating. And we'll look at the final shortcut that I wanna talk about. And that's this stamp one using the apostrophe key. So if I press stamp, what it's gonna do is it's gonna just drop that projection anywhere that I stamp it. So I can just move it around and this really quickly, rather than having to sit there and paint through it, you can do that. And if I combine that with the start repeating image, the semicolon key, and I stamp that again, and you'll see that it now tiles that stamp as well. And that could just be, especially if you're using tile textures, a really quick way to just cover a lot of ground. Obviously it's not gonna be perfect, but it's a good shortcut to know. And then I could start cleaning that up if I really wanted to. So let's look at a third and final case use for this. So I'm looking at my shader now and it's very green. And why is that? Well, I've just set up a very, very basic node graph that we're going to go over again in the next video. I don't know how many times I'm going to say that. So really don't worry too much about this, but I've got one color here, which is white. And then I'm merging green on top. 
And what I'm going to do is I don't want that green everywhere. So I'm just going to put in this black paint node. I'm going to view that and you'll see that this is a black mask that I'm going to use by just plugging into the mask. And now you'll see there is white everywhere. So what I could do is I could paint into this mask. I could use the paint tool like we were discussing earlier, and then I could start masking it out. But what if this was, if I wanted this green to be like grime or grunge or moss or something? Well, just using this paint tool doesn't look that good. What if I wanted to use a projection of some sort of grunge texture or something to help me make that mask? Well, we can do that. So I've got this grunge leaks image that I've baked out from Substance. Um, I've taken their procedures because they're so bloody good. And I'm just going to paint through this now. Why do I want to do that? Well, basically, it's just a really quick way to get some nice breakup to this mask. And you can see that that green is quite bright, actually. Let's, let's bring that down slightly, just so we can see it a little bit better. And you see now very, very quickly using painting into this mask, I can get some very quick custom breakup that's, that's a lot quicker than using a custom brush like we set up earlier in the video. And I can just now kind of get some very, very quick grungy looking textures. So these are just three quick case uses for the projection tool, but honestly, it's one of the tools I use the most inside of Mari. And like I mentioned earlier, we've got all these tool settings in our tool properties, like with the paintbrush tool. And honestly, I never really use any of these. You can change your paintbrush as well. So I could use in the shelf, I could change over to example, this felt tip one if I wanted to. And that is quite useful. Um, it's all changeable inside of the tool properties. I never really touched those with the projection tool, but it's completely doable. The main ones I use are this reset, just if the scale's gone a bit weird, or if I want to set a custom rotation, I can do that all of here and I can change the translation as well. Um, but usually I just use the keyboard shortcuts that I went through earlier. Um, and you can also change one quite useful one is I can change the scale lock. So if I turn that on and now when I zoom, it stays consistent to the, the model. So no matter how much I move out, that can be really useful if, for example, you're doing stitching or you're doing clothing detail and stuff that you don't want to change scale across your object, then that's super useful. And then also with the pan lock, so if I were to move the camera around it, you'll see that it stays in the same position to the mesh. And with those combined, let's just, I'm going to scale it down. We'll put it over this eye. And if I were to scale there, you'll see no matter where I move, it kind of stays the same. The pan lock and scale lock are both available from up here in the top of the shelf as well. You don't have to go through the tool properties to do that. Uh, just worth mentioning. Um, yeah, and I think that's basically all I wanna talk about with projections in this video. Um, they're not anything to be scared of and they're super, super useful. Uh, yeah, in the next video, we're gonna properly go over the node graph. So all this stuff that I've been doing and I've been telling you not to worry about, we're gonna actually touch on in the next one. So join me in that for part five for the node graph. Um, if you've got any questions, then feel free to leave them below. You can join the Discord to post any works in progress you have or anything that you're working on. A lot of people have been doing that now and it's really, really cool. Um, or ask any questions as well. People have been doing that too. Cool, I've been Michael Wilde. Thanks very much for watching. Take it easy and have a good one, whatever you're doing in 3D, whether that's modeling, texturing, or God knows what. Cool.